and welcome to Stories Found. Each week we feature funny stories, plays, and sketches from some of the most talented comedy writers in the world. I'm your host, Ava Love Hanna, a writer and humorist in Austin, Texas. Joining me is my writing partner, audio engineer, and all-around cool guy, Paul Hanna. You're listening to Stories Found. Our featured organization this week is one of our very favorite shows, Testify, a live storytelling show in Austin, Texas. The amazing crew at Testify love stories, hearing them, crafting them, and sharing them. Each month, Testify offers a live show featuring true stories told by the people that lived them. If you're in the Austin area and have a story to tell, they'd love to hear it. You can submit your own story to one of their themed opportunities on their website, testifyatx.com. Or, if you're just in the mood to hear some really fantastic stories from past shows, check out their YouTube channel, Testify Austin. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Stories Found. This week we're talking to the amazing storyteller, Lottie Loetta, and then hearing his very funny story, Five Calls. Lottie is an artist, animal lover, and award-winning storyteller. He won The Moth with a story about sympathetic nausea and what it teaches us about love and connection. He's a homebody whose idea of traveling the globe is going to a different H-E-B. If you're ever looking for him, well, he's most likely at home. (laughs) Lottie is charming, funny, and a real joy to hang out with, and we are honored to have him with us today. Hi, Lottie. Welcome to Stories Found. Howdy. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, we are really, really excited to have you here and and to have a chance to chat about your story, Five Calls. It is really, really funny. I have to say that. Well, it's funny, but the sad thing is it's also true. (laughs) That's what's great about it. So we'll go ahead. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear today. Don't give too much away yet, but just tell us a little bit about your story. I, I just want to say this. There are people in the world who, when you're dating, uh, they're all in the moment you meet them. And those people are really annoying people. <laughs> and, and I know this because I am one of those people. <laughs> and it. I have been told how annoying that is. No, it's great. And it makes for a great story. So. It does. It does. But I, I am that way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from, if I like you, I'm, I'm all. I'm That's there, it. baby. <laughs> Well, so uh, I have to tell you, okay, so the story is hilarious. And you sent it over and I happened to be sitting there at the time. And when the email came in and Paul was right next to me, I said, hey, we got a story. Let's listen to it. And so we listened together. And we were both laughing so hard because <laughs> it's funny. And, and it is. It's it's a little cringy. <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's cringy. it's really sweet. And, and it's relatable, which is, you know, that those are all the factors you need for a great story, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so I want to say, though. I had one problem with it is that I wanted to accept it like right away. I was like, no, man, I got to play it cool. I got to like wait a couple days. I can't like, I can't. Ex- so it shows just how relatable the story is for me. <laughs> Cause yeah, I yes, was like, I- I'm all to, in. You have to wait your three, your three day period. <laughs> exactly. Well. Exactly. I couldn't email you within 30 minutes and be like, okay, yes, please. So yeah. So, the, okay. So the story is, it's, it's about you. You meet yes. someone and you end up calling them and then calling them and calling them, yes. <laughs> waiting for after, a response. After I, and I knew better. And yeah. I knew better. But something happens, right, when you're excited or you're like, oh, I, I just need to fix it. And every time we go to fix something, <laughs> yes. it gets worse. <laughs> and I, it, yes, something else falls off. And that was the case. It, 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 I, don't, I don't know why I work, but I do. I have my theories of, <laughs> uh, of why I work this way. I, I, I've i seen my mother. She got a new puppy and I've seen her raise this puppy. And every <laughs> once in a while, I'll look at him and I go, that's why I'm this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, well, okay. Well, you have someone to blame. So that then yes. you can be like, it's yes. not me. You can, yeah, you got it's, not me. it's not me. It's got to be someone else. <laughs> well, 
So the story takes place in Houston, and, and you really you do such a great job of describing the setting. And I think that's another thing we loved about it is Paul and I are both from Houston. We lived in the Montrose area for years and years. And I feel like I know the exact paper place you're talking about the story. And 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 as soon as you mentioned going to a restaurant, we're like, it's gonna be Baba Yegas. It's gonna and it was, right? <laughs> so so were you raised in Houston or you just did you spend time there? No, I, I I'm born and raised in Houston. Uh mm-hmm. And so I, so I know, and it was the place was on Studemont. I don't know if, if that mm-hmm, helped, mm-hmm, but, yep. but that is so funny. I, I, I born and I, and I, I go intermittently to visit family. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, uh, Chris and I moved to to California, and then California, we moved back to Austin. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Because California was too much. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it seems beautiful, but you know, when you're here's the thing, I keep meeting people who are from Houston. It's like we all have this this shared trauma. We kind of can't get away from it. We can't stray too far. <laughs> yes, because I wanted, I liked, I, I I know Texas is problematic about so right. many things, but I still like it here. I know that's the thing. So, well, what brought you to Austin then? Uh, originally, I moved to originally, uh, Chris and I moved to Lago Vista. Mm-hmm. And I moved from there to to Houston prop uh, to Austin proper. Mm-hmm. It was just it it was time to move into. The, I, I did so many things in Austin that mm-hmm. it was ridiculous having this forty five minute ride two or three times a day. Oh right, yeah. You know, from Lago Vista to Austin, then back home, then to so I just ended up moving to Austin. Well, and Austin has such a fantastic storytelling scene. I know Houston does too, but I think, I mean, we have, we just have a really great theater and storytelling think, scene here. I think ours is funkier. Yes, I do too. <laughs> I think we've got, we've got some really interesting stories here. <laughs> well, so, okay. So everybody talks about, you know, storytelling sometimes when I'll mention it and they're like, well, what do you, wait, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, well, you know, where you're telling stories are like, like at a party. I'm like, well, Okay, not exactly. So I know that um, I wasn't really aware of storytelling at first. And then I was in Austin, I was a new mom. And you know, I had a four year old and I had a friend who was a performer, she had done uh, spoken word poetry, and she knew the whole scene. And she asked me how my day went, we're at the library. And I'm like telling her, you know, God, like it was like a train wreck. And he's asking about genitals, and I might have scarred him for life. And, and she's looking for a book, she's hunched down on like a bottom shelf. And she starts laughing so hard at what I'm telling her, she falls over and she looks looks up at me from the ground and she's like, you have to tell people this story. I'm like, um, no, thank you. And, and so she was like, no, you do. And so that's how I got introduced to storytelling. You know, I ended up on stage telling it. And every time afterward, people are like, oh, thank God for telling that. That happened to me too. So, so does that happen to you? How, like, how did you find your way into storytelling? Well, first off, I want to say that does happen to me. Something else I want to say is I know the story you're talking about. And I heard that and I was crying. I was laughing so loud. That is such a wonderful story. Well, thank you. So when it was happening, it wasn't as funny. But I think that's what's so great about the this, this storytelling world is we get a chance to sort of reflect and go. Well, it's what okay. I think. I, I think they credit this to, to, to Mel Brooks, but I don't know if someone said it before him. But he always said that uh, uh, something, if it happens, if I fall down and hurt myself, that is a tragedy. Uh-huh. But if you fall down and hurt yourself, <laughs> that is comedy. Yes. It is. <laughs> we, we have no problem laughing at someone else, even if they've done the same thing we did. It, it just softens the blow a little. Oh, definitely. definitely. So so where, when did you tell your first story? How did you, how did you I, find your way into this? Uh I'm trying not to say things because I don't want to say anything that that that, that interferes with the story that you're going to hear. That's okay. okay. Because because I I in my personal view is that when you tell a story, the story lives in the place that it is. Yes. And if you give people a lot of information before or after, it it takes away from that moment of the story. Oh, definitely. Does that make sense? Yes, so, definitely. So so this is what I'm going to say. I did. I, I joined Toastmasters. Mm-hmm. And and from there, uh, I I found my way to testify. I told a story, and from that point on, I loved it. Oh, I yeah. absolutely loved it. I I did it at other events, and, and then Kate, who used to run testify, she oh, had yeah. a baby, and oh, she yes. decided, you know, the testify was was it had been her baby, but now she has a real one. Oh so, yeah. 
<laughs> so I took it over and I love, I love working with storytellers. I, I love hearing people's uh, stories, their story ideas, and helping them create the arc or or whatever it is they're trying to say. To me, it's just so much fun helping people relate themselves to an audience because invariably the audience understands. Oh, always, yes, that they is get amazing. It. Mm -hmm. They 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 no matter how bad you think what you did is, something <laughs> the audience is going, oh, I've done that. Yeah. And you know, it's just that the whole human condition, right? Like, and I, I it's been amazing to me because I've been to testify a bunch of times and to sit there and to hear, you know, say, like say five different stories in one night, each one different, every storyteller with different, you know, sort of operational filters, but every story was relatable. Um, you know, I, I think one time, so George Saunders, I had read an essay and he'd gone to Dubai and he was writing about uh, you know, sort of, he didn't get his advance yet. And he's staying in this very fancy, you know, hotel in Dubai, and they're wanting to kick him out, because his credit card was re was rejected. And oh, so he's no. like talking about hiding in this hotel, <laughs> <laughs> until maybe the magazine will send his advance over. And and I've never been to Dubai, but I remember going, Oh, God, this really feels really relatable about, you know, when you're new in your career, and you don't really have money, and they're asking you to go do these travel things. So that's what I think I love so much about storytelling is you can always find one or two things in any story that you can relate to. I, I absolutely agree. And, and I found that uh, working with Testify, working with the storytellers that we get now. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, if you get a chance, come and see or come tell a story. We'd love to have you. Oh, uh, I, I will. I, I'm gonna I come have back. to say that and I want it on record. <laughs> Well, I've been I've been hiding away like a hermit. I was like, all right, it's time to. And you guys, I mean, it is just the production values are fantastic. So yes, yes, it's very tempting. Everyone should tell a story with Testify. So I, I would love it, and, and awesome. we like working with it because what's interesting to me is uh, I, I'm not going to say that. we have people that come with their idea of what a story is, mm -hmm. and, and we help them with that. And, and one of the guys that was telling the story, apparently he had been telling the story for 25 years uh -huh. and, and it's his favorite story. And it's about a, a plane wreck that he was in. Uh -huh. But when you know something, you talk in a language that no one else gets. Yes. And since he understands planes, he was going, the, the confabulator was retortioned <laughs> and, and, and the squib <laughs> went to the floor and, and, I, and no one knew what he was talking about. And I worked with him on, on how to make this more uh, comprehensible for the audience. And after the show, his wife came and told me, this is the first time I have ever understood what he is talking about. That is awesome. She said, Thank you so much for helping him. Now I don't mind if he tells the story to other people. Well, so I think that I do. I love that about Testify because I have had people, I've had friends say, oh, I couldn't tell a story. I'm like, yes, you can. They will help you. And I think that's what's so great about experienced storytellers is is helping people sort of realize, oh, you know, I do have these these big sort of memoir moments in my own life, right? Well, and I think because people always think that a story is die hard or you have to be a, a firefighter who raced into a house oh, right. and saved no. burning <laughs> kittens and babies. But but a some a really nice story can just be you got up in the morning you went on a walk and you saw a butterfly and it made you cry and this reminds you of something oh, and that yes. that's a beautiful moment it is. And you know what? That's what I will tell people. They're like, well, where do you start your story? I'm like, well, for me, I kind of start in the middle. It's a crystallized moment. And I go, there's something about this moment that's important. And yes. then to work my way out from that. What did I learn? Where did I go? I, that all will come, you know, but you got to have that moment. So obviously, so people will ask writers like, well, where do you get your ideas? Well, in storytelling, well, duh, it's your own life. But how do you personally know when something is a story versus just sort of an anecdote or a, a funny moment? Like, what is it that that makes it for you? Well, I, I, I think a story, you really have to, uh, there, there's a, there, there's an arc there. Mm -hmm. And I, the way I look at a story is I, I know every, they say it has a beginning, a middle and an end, but mm -hmm. a banana has a beginning, a middle and an end. <laughs> so that's not different from anything else. Right. I, I think of it, I look at it is, uh, there's who you are, mm -hmm. then what happens and who you become. Yes, and that's exactly. the thing. Because you're it's something that causes you to change, and it doesn't have to be a lifelong change. It could be a change that lasts a day, but something that was important enough to you to cause some sort of change there for you. Exactly. I think that's what people find interesting, because we go through this all the time. We're we're not the same people from day one to day two. 
Uh, oh, exactly. I'll, I'll wake up in the morning and I, 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 I've been having oatmeal for two weeks because I'm on an oatmeal kick and, and, and there's my partner gets more oatmeal. I said, no oatmeal! <laughs> <laughs> because something has changed and I and it's 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 interesting these things that change in us they are wonderful stories because we all we all have those moments where you're driving on the freeway and everything is nice and all of a sudden you're really hacked off about something oh yeah <laughs> and that's a story because exactly. something something caused you to remember being hacked off what was it why mm-hmm. are you mad all of a sudden and i love those moments oh it <laughs> I think they're so important. And if you notice, like, so, so shows like This American Life, you know, which has a degree of storytelling, oh. that was my first exposure, I think, to storytelling. Um, and then, you know, The Moth, Testify, you guys sell out pretty much every show ever. So what is it about these storytelling shows you think that is so addictive to people? I think, uh, you know, the thing that they say, I can't remember his name, it's, it's that very foreign sounding name and it's only foreign sounding to me because i'm an american i'm sure to him it sounds absolutely normal uh but he says that storytelling is what created who we are Mm -hmm. that without storytelling we would not be where we are now Mm -hmm. and and, and i i think that's true that the the first stories people told were were uh stories of survival Mm -hmm. just like the word run is a story because there's an implied noun and you know you got to get out of there Mm -hmm. So if you look at stories as things of survival, then I think they are still that. But the world has changed so much that it's not it's not inhospitable to a lot of us like it used to be. So now stories are more about emotional change, Mm -hmm. emotional dangers and emotional uh, things that we have to go through. So it's still about survival, but it's moved to our head and our heart as opposed to chasing down dinner. Exactly. You know, I'll tell you, uh, one time, it happens a lot when I'm typing storytelling, I always have a typo and it ends up being story yelling. And I'm like, you know what? I love that. That works too, <laughs> especially right now. You know, that sounds like another idea for a show. It does. Story yelling. <laughs> storytelling in angry times. No, <laughs> there we go. We've already pitched it. We've got it. <laughs> I kind of like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, so one thing I have run into is explaining this genre do you ever have a hard time like when you're putting out a call for submissions and you're saying you know we want stories and i've seen it happen to you guys it happens to us how do you go about explaining what testify is what you're looking for you know it doesn't seem to matter how many times you do it (laughs) there's always the next person that says but what but what like you yeah (laughs) <laughs> because people have an idea of what a story is, right? And, and uh, it's usually they're just a fun anecdote or, or, or a mm-hmm. nice romp of a story. It's not an actual story the way testify classif- right. classifies the story, the which true is we, we want an art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and and people will also think that they don't have one because they say nothing happens in my life. You're you're thirty, you're forty, you're fifty. Things have happened to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Things happen to us all day long. So uh, when we tell them what we do at Testify is we make a safe space for people to share who they are with an audience that wants to learn about them. Oh yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so let me just, let me see here. I do have one final question for you. Oh, please. And it's probably the most important. So <laughs> if I had called you five times asking you to be on the podcast, would you have still agreed to be here today? You would have had me at the first call. Because <laughs> I would have called you five times if you hadn't responded. <laughs> We were like, I remember I sent to the email. I was like, okay, now I just got to wait for him to respond. This is such a good story. So I'm really, really, really excited for everyone to hear it today. Oh, my goodness. Well, so, thank you so much. I'm well, glad to be part of this. I went and listened. As soon as you put out that call, I went to see listen to your whole season. And I loved it. I loved uh, the plays. I loved the stories. I loved everything. Well, we are super excited to have you. You're going to fit in perfectly. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I cannot wait. I wish I could listen to this for the first time with everyone. <laughs> so it is, it's that good. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a blast. Thank you, Ava. Bye-bye. We know you love Stories Found, but have you ever sat and wondered, wow, How can I let other people know just how much I love Stories Found? Fortunately, we're here to help. 
head over to storiesfound.com forward slash support. We've got a list of fun, free, or even paid ways to show your support and to help us keep paying our amazingly talented writers and actors. Soon, the whole world will know just how much you love comedy and supporting the arts. Head over to storiesfound.com forward slash support. Stories Found is now proud to present Five Calls by Lottie Loetta. I used to work in a paper warehouse in Houston. We sold skids of paper to businesses, churches, and schools. And one day, Chris walked in. And when I saw him, my stomach just dropped. There was something about him. Now, we also had a small office supply section, and that was the place that I was mostly in charge of. So I helped him put an order together and called him the next day when everything came in. He smiled so easily, and it was such a nice smile. I already had a big crush on this guy. Over the course of the month, he started coming in more and more regularly, and towards the end of the month, he was coming in every day, sometimes two or three times a day. Now, we had regular customers, and some of them would come in several times a day as well. But with Chris, it felt different. At least I hoped it did. One day, I am helping him put together an order, and he looks at me and says, You know, you have always been so helpful to me. I would like to take you out for a beer. Three things. Yay! (laughs) The other thing, I hate beer. I have never had a beer that I've liked. People have always told me I'm drinking the wrong ones. It's the problem is the same with all of them. The taste. Third thing, I'm going to drink that beer anyway. (laughs) Chris picks me up at work. I get off at 530. We head out to a restaurant called Bobby Yega. We have dinner and a couple of beers. It was worth it. (laughs) And we get to know each other. Now, up until this point... I am not even sure if this is a gay person. This is the 80s in Texas. We didn't talk about our sexuality. I was out to friends and coworkers and my family, but I wasn't out to everyone who came into the store, even the people with nice smiles. But over dinner, I found out, yes, indeed, this was a gay guy. In fact, he had been in a long-term relationship, almost 10 years. He had recently broken up with his partner, super recently, like that very morning. <laughs> and they and they were going to continue living in the house that they had bought together. Now, some of you hear red flags. <laughs> I just hear that he's available. <laughs> anyway, we spend a couple of hours talking. It's been a while, and it's really time for us to leave the restaurant, but we are having a nice time. We don't want to quit the evening, so he suggests that we go for a walk along Buffalo Bayou. We're following the trails, and we decide to take one of the trails at least closer down onto the bayou, and we pass what can only be called a herd of fireflies. It was amazing. It was as if the universe said, let's give these guys a candlelit evening. We sat there and looked in awe And then we looked at each other, and we kissed. And it was a date. And we continued walking for about an hour, holding hands and talking, just getting to know each other. But it was late, and I had to go back to work the next day, and so did he. So he dropped me off at my car, and I went home. Now, I have no recollection of how I got home, because all I did was play the date over and over in my head the whole time. The following morning at work, I was myself, and I tend to be a bit ridiculous at times, I was plotting the future, where we'd live, how many pets we'd have, the pets' names, the pet names we'd call each other. But what I didn't know is what's the proper etiquette, you know, when dating. Years earlier, I had gone to the University of Houston, and at some point, I became the president of the the gay group we had on campus. So I was trying to recall conversations I'd had with some of the other people. And there's the common thing, you know, three days. You can't call for three days. But someone else said, no, it's five days. It's a working week. (laughs) And then someone else, no, it's absolutely three days, but it's a very specific three days. It's from Friday evening through Sunday evening because they have to know that you have other plans if they don't book you. (laughs) And then I had a friend named Jim. Jim just looked at us like we were all insane. Never! 
never call. You don't call them. If they don't call you, you move on. I have never had Jim's self-confidence. I probably never will. But I looked at everything that I had been thinking. I tried to do the math and plot out the perfect time to call. So I called him that day at 10. <laughs> Hi, Chris. This is Lottie. I had a great time yesterday. It was so nice getting the chance to sit and talk to you and get to know more about you. I hope we can do this again sometime soon. I have lunch 12, 12-ish. If you want to come by, we can have lunch together and visit. It would be great. I hung up the phone. That was a good call. I was proud of this call. I did not come across creepy. I did not come across desperate. I was nice. I was cordial. I was inviting. That call, I had nailed it. So you can only imagine how sad I was when he didn't call. And he didn't come back for lunch. <sighs> well, love requires action. And I am a man of action. <laughs> so I called back at 1230. <laughs> hey, Chris, this is Lottie. I called you earlier and you didn't call me back and you didn't drop by for lunch and I was just calling to make sure you got the message and to let you know I'm here at lunch. If you feel like coming by, you can come on by. We can visit for a little bit. It would be great to see you again. Bye. That call sounded worse. I did feel like I sounded a little bit desperate during that call. In fact, I feel like I came across clingy and needy and I'm not clingy and needy. Except at times I can be a little bit clingy and needy and I know this about myself. And you know, it would be the worst thing if that's the way Chris remembers me from now on. And if he never calls me because of that stupid message. So I called again 45 minutes later. <laughs> hey, Chris. This is Lottie. I know I've already called you twice, thrice with this call. <laughs> uh, I just want to say... I know it seems kind of weird that I'm calling you a lot, but I'm not really a weirdo. And yes, I know that's probably something weirdo people say, but I'm here. And if you want to come by, I have lunch at the same time all the time. You can come by anytime. We'll visit. It'd be great. Call me. I hung up the phone and I am disgusted with myself. <laughs> there is no reason for such blatant weirdness on my part. And I wonder what is wrong with me? Do you know what the Skinner box is? The Skinner box is the box they used to run experiments on animals a long time ago, psychological experiments. They would put a bird in it, or a rodent of some kind, and they'd hit a lever and they'd get a pellet of food. Well, what they find is that if they keep heading the lever and they don't get a pellet of food, they do something different. Like maybe the bird will pick up its wing and then it hits the lever, it gets the food. So now it marries those two things together and it thinks it has to pick up the arm in order to get the pellet. But then at some point it doesn't get the pellet. So now it tries to figure out what else it needs to do. So it picks up a leg and it does this and now it has this modern dance ritual that it is doing just trying to get fed. In my family, I was the rodent in the Skinner box. <laughs> My parents are nice people, but they did some weird stuff. <laughs> I find that they were not stingy with love at all, but they're kind of unreliable. Uh, what was cute one day was annoying the next day. What got you hugged one day got you scolded the next day. So all I was trying to do was find a way to be loved, but it kept changing. So there was no way me just being myself was ever going to be good enough. But what cemented this in my head was a conversation I had with my mother. I don't know what I had done. I probably had not cleaned my room, which as an adult is still a problem. <laughs> and she looked at me, at the little boy that I was, and said in my mother's most beautiful sing-song voice, well, if you don't do what your mother tells you, I guess your mother just won't love you anymore. Oh my God! Can you imagine saying that to your child and thinking, oh, this is good. This is healthy for him. <laughs> At this time, I realized that my parents, no matter how much love they have, me, have for me, they're just not safe. And for me, love is safety. Love is when you're able to be as weird as you naturally are, and there is still someone there willing to hold your hand. My fourth call... <laughs> 
was significantly shorter than the others. Hey, I know I've called a lot. It's just that I really had a great time. And I know I'm coming off weird, but I'm really a good guy. Give me a call. I hung up the phone. I am so, so angry at myself. I am walking around the store helping customers, but mentally kicking myself in the stomach the whole time. My fifth call (laughs) was very simple. Hey, I'm so sorry. My heart was broken already, but it's my fault. I am the idiot in this, and I realize this. I don't understand what is wrong with me. It doesn't matter how I was raised. There is something inherently not right here. It's 5.30. We're getting ready to shut down the shop. I'm at the back register closing things out, and my boss comes and says, I think that guy you've been calling is out front. (laughs) My first thought is, whatever you do, don't run to the front door. Don't run to the front door. I ran to the front door. And Chris was there smiling. He said, I've been at work at this stupid meeting all day. I just got home, took a quick shower, and decided to come and see if you wanted to go out for dinner. I said, you didn't get my calls? You called? I swear, I heard a smile in his voice. He said, yeah. But of course, I'm an idiot. So the next question, he says, five times? (laughs) And I saw him. And his face just looked at me for a while. And then it melted into the most beautiful smile. He said, that is awesome. (laughs) Well, why didn't he get my messages? Well, it turns out that his ex that he had just broken up with the day before took that day off and heard each and every one of my messages and erased them, each one as they came through. So he would never have known I'd called had I not been idiot enough to tell him. And he would have come to pick me up for dinner all on his own. I know, it is an awe. (laughs) It feels to me like we have so many rules about the way we're supposed to be and who you need to be and the correct way to act. And all I really know how to be is me. But every once in a while... That's enough. You've just heard five calls by Lottie Loetta. We'll have a post on our website with more information about Lottie, as well as links to his website and social media pages. You can find all of that on storiesfound.com. Thanks for listening to Stories Found. We've been your hosts, Ava Love Hanna and Paul Hanna. Get more info about this week's episode, subscribe to our newsletter, or submit your own story and be a featured storyteller in a future episode. You can do all that and more on our website, storiesfound.com. Stories Found was recorded at ELA Studios deep in the heart of Austin, Texas. 